Uh, good evening, everyone. As we're getting settled in, and as, uh, waiting a few for a few people to trickle on in, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, but before we uh, do anything, uh, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for today. Father, we thank you for um, this time. We thank you for our Wednesday nights where we come together to uh, sing of your praise, uh, to spend time in your word, uh, to study it uh, intentionally uh, with the hopes of uh, learning new things and being reminded of old things as well. Father, all in all, we, we give you this time. I, we pray that you would be honored and glorified in all of the things that we give and offer to you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. song, right? When we are few, we are strong. Amen. Jesus is mine. We 
Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I sing with all. Father, we thank you for this time. Uh, God, we ask that you would just continually uh, anoint this place. God, would you continually uh, ready our, our minds and our hearts. God, I pray that we would be able to uh, intently look at your word. And that God, through it, you would speak to us. God, I pray that it would resonate uh, with us. And when conviction is necessary, God, may we not ignore it. But God, may we see it as an opportunity uh, to experience more of you and more of your grace. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, good evening, everyone. I hope you are well this beautiful uh, Wednesday evening. Um, it looks like we are finally uh, getting some much-needed Pacific Northwest summer weather. And last time I checked, uh, this weekend is going to be a warm one. So please, please, please make sure you stay hydrated and enjoy the weather while you can because I believe after this weekend, it's going to cool off. And according to some news reports that I saw, it's not going to be a while until we experience the more summer heat, so enjoy it while you can, but please be safe. Uh, last week, we talked about the importance of, of, you know, of what we teach and how we, as, in, how we uh, as followers of Christ, right? we as recipients of the gospel, we as people who have been called uh, to some, in some way, shape, or form to, to share the gospel, right? we talked about how uh, we are responsible for the things that we teach. Right? especially when it pertains to uh, living this life for God. And one of the things that we noticed was that James warns us that we will be judged with a greater strictness. And that's because right, it makes sense that we are you know, not only responsible for ourselves, but we are also responsible for those we lead, but more specifically how we lead them. Right? Because whatever it is that you say, whatever it is that you, you instill into somebody, they're going to learn from it. They're going to try to utilize it, and they're going to respond with their life. And if we lead them in the wrong direction, if we lead them astray, well, then part of that responsibility is on us. And so, you know, we are responsible for those things, and so we have to be mindful. But I think one of the things that kind of gets lost, right, when we, whenever we talk about that particular uh, section in Scripture is that it's not meant to scare us away from teaching, if that makes sense, right? It is, it is a, a, a frank warning, right? It, it, it is something that ha, uh, has a lot of implications and repercussions. But it's meant, for, it's meant for us to understand those, right? And that um, it's meant for us to understand that so that when we are presented with the opportunity to teach or to lead or to offer advice, that we would not only be slow to speak, but we would be mindful of the things that we say, but ultimately, that we, the way that I would like to phrase it is that we would be on top of our game, right? Because Paul, right, Paul says in, uh, in his letters that at, by some point you should be teachers, right? And so if we're thinking about the way that we mature as Christians, as the way that we progress in our faith, well, then we're not meant to be a, what we might call like a, a baby Christian or an immature Christian, right? As we are walking in faith, as we are in fellowship with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and as we are continually seeking the Lord, then, yes, right, there should be some growth and maturity on our end. And that should be something that God should be able to utilize for his kingdom's benefit, right, and for his glory so that we could advance the gospel, so that we could lead other brothers and sisters into a maturity, into a, uh, into, into a deeper intimacy when it comes to their faith. And not that everyone is called to be a teacher, not that everyone is called to hold the position 
of a teacher. But I believe that everyone is called to grow in their faith. And faith will be of service. And ultimately, that should be our goal, right? But one of the things that James uh, puts a great deal of emphasis on when it comes to the teaching side uh, of things is our tongue, right? Or more specifically, the words we say, the way that we might speak to others, the way that we might speak of others, the way that we might present ourselves in, in terms of just the conversations that we might spur up or the demeanor in which we communicate. You see, he uses this analogy, right? Well, this is a read from last week, right? He uses the analogy of a horse and the bits that are put into its mouth and then the small rudder of a ship, all large things that are heavily influenced by what? Such a small thing, right? And so we, we have to take seriously, right, what Paul, uh, what James is saying when, it, when he is referring to the tongue. You see, the power and influence of the tongue is something that should not be taken lightly, but it should be something that we observe with hesitancy, right? It should be something that we observe with great warning. We should heed to those warnings, but it's not meant to scare us away, but it's meant to separate us, right, from the rest of the world. It's meant to distinguish us as people who are walking with Christ. And hopefully as we kind of go through uh, the remainder of the tongue section of James, we can kind of see how that plays a part into our lives, right? Because tonight we are looking at the power of the tongue. And I think it's safe to say that James lays out for us not only the power, but really the magnitude the tongue has in our lives and this great power that we possess. And so as we uh, look at that, right, uh, please keep in mind just the severity of the tongue and what that might look like for you personally. Don't think about how other people speak or anything like that, but just from your own personal perspective. Like how, does that, how does that reflect you, okay? And so uh, tonight we're going to be looking at James chapter 3, verses 5 to 12. So if we could stand as we uh, give reverence to God's word, as we read it aloud. This is what James writes, who continues to write, starting with verse 5. He says, How great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Whoa. Right, so for every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our, our Lord and Father. And with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to ought be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. All right, let us be seated. You know, I, I was thinking about all the things in life that only takes one for things to change its course, to change our outlook, or even change our lives as we know it. I thought about all the things that might kind of, kind of like can change the course of a game with this one incident. And so, for example, these are, these are silly, but they are meant to, I don't know, engage our minds tonight, all right? So, for example, let's see if you know this slogan, right? Once you pop, you can't. Do you guys know how to finish it? Once you pop, you can't. Stop. Do you get no? Once you pop, you can't stop. It is the Pringles slogan, right? And their whole their whole demeanor is all you have to do is just open a can, and it's game over, right? You're 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 just gonna keep eating those chips. I'm guilty of that. All right. Another chip company said, "Bet you just can't eat one." Right, and that would be Lay's potato chip. And this one is kind of a stretch, but in my head, it makes sense, right? There's this board game, and you would yell out letter and number, right, as a guess, right? So, for example, you would say something like D7, and, and if 
it was a, if, if it was a, her, a direct hit, you would say, ah, you sank my battleship, right, the board game. But all it took was one good guess to sink a battleship. You know, other, other sayings talk about, you know, one day, uh, one moment, right, when it comes to life changing, or, or one step at a time. But the thing that we have to understand is that it's just, it, just, it just takes one. One thing, one moment, one occurrence that kind of changes the course or changes the attitude or ch- changes the demeanor or just kind of, ch- it can really flip a relationship upside down. But what if I said that all it took was one, one wrong word to ruin things, right? What if I said all it takes is one moment of unfiltered anger or uncontrolled emotions to destroy something you spent years building? That's the power of the tongue. How many, how many of us in, in, our, in our anger have, have said something? We didn't mean it, kind of. And under, under normal circumstances, we wouldn't have said those things. But in our, in our anger and our rage and our uncontrollable you know, state of emotions, we might have said something, we might blur something out, we might say something that we've, we've kind of been bottling in. But all it takes is one moment to ruin years of something that you've built, whether that would be a, a, a sibling relationship, whether that would be a friendship, or even a, 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 a marriage, Right? And James is, is warning us of its power, right? the, the power of the tongue, but more importantly, uh, the ramifications that will come as a result of this power that we, as talking individuals, yield. You see, in verse 5, James says, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a what? Small fire. Now, all it takes is a small fire to set ablaze an entire forest. And as somebody who has lived in Southern California for, uh, you know, roughly 14 years, I think I know a thing or two when it comes to forest fires, right? There's a, a combination of heat, there's a combination of dry land, and uh, either a small spark from something as simple as a car that's carrying a load and, and maybe like a chain kind of falls off and creates a spark that's enough to set a fire, or wh- whether that be somebody who's, in, who's a little unresponsible or just not thinking at all, and then they're smoking and they're done with their cigarette and they just toss it out of the car, not thinking much of where it might land, that is enough to spark not only a fire, but really set a blaze that is really uncontrollable. In Southern California, like the, you know, seeing a brush fire on the side of the freeway is something that was far too common. Or think even here in, in Washington, I think it was about two years ago, right, the Pacific Northwest experienced this intense battle with the forest fire. I don't know if you guys remember, but the sky was, was covered with smoke for days or I think weeks. Right? It was raining ashes, and in the rare event that it actually rained, it was probably one of the dirtiest rains that we have ever seen. Right? It was pretty gross. And I think most recently in 2021, there was a massive, fire, uh, massive forest fire in California, all thanks to a gender reveal that went wrong, right? All it takes is what? A small spark, right? One small fire. But I would also add a bit because it's also because of, of there's dryness, right? And we, we can uh, try to make a, a spiritual connection with the drought that might be, that exists in the lives of us to, that really sets a fire, you know, and victimizes the people around us. But all these things play a factor or play a role in the accelerating of, or the acceleration of a fire. And yes, the tongue can set, a, a set an entire forest fire, a forest on fire. Right? That's true. But all it takes is for someone to say something to the wrong person. All it takes is, all, all it takes is for us to say something at the wrong time or at an insensitive time, say something. Or, I don't know speak out of pocket for things to escalate out of control. So think even in today's social climate. You say the wrong thing to the wrong person while driving. Next thing you know, you're on the 5 o'clock news or 6 o'clock news. Next thing you know, you're in a news tribune, right? Like how many, how many countless, I guess, articles and, and news clips have we seen of people um, reacting out of their road rage, Right? 
But it's not like people drive around angry. But all it takes is what? One small spark to really light them on fire. Figuratively. Right? <laughs> and for them to act all, 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 all crazy. So all it takes is a spark to get things going. But from there, things spread fast, uncontrollably fast. It's not like when you set, when you set a, 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 it's not like when a, when a forest is set on fire that it just kind of slowly burns and we just kind of know the direction. No, it's out of control. Right? And, and things, it, it, it's really hard to even, you know, get it under control. See, this is, I, I would say the tongue being a small fire is something that could be not only a negative, but also a, a positive, right? It can go both ways. Right? I think you can view this from a negative standpoint and see the damage it can create. But also the flip side of the tongue is that it has great potential to, to motivate, to raise up, to rile up people, and even start something as like a revolution. Think of all the uh, countless prophets, right, warning people with a word from God, right, to people advocating. It all begins with what? tongue, the words that we speak, the way that we would speak, the way that we would influence, right, those that are around us. But that's just a side note because James, James wants us to see the dark side, right, the dark side of nature of the tongue, right? In verse 6, he says the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. You see, the tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life. And set on fire by hell. He calls the tongue a fire, right? A world of unrighteousness. Such a strong statement. Even in Proverbs 16, 27, Solomon writes, A worthless man plots evil, and his speech is like a scorching fire. Trying to take down whoever is in the path. But practically speaking, like how is the tongue a world of unrighteousness? You know, it sounds harsh that James would make the correlation with the tongue. But if we are honest with ourselves, right, if we were to make an honest assessment, how controlled are our words when we are met with things like frustration, anger, impatience, and there I might add, hunger, Right? And far too often, in our reaction, we speak without a filter. Far too often, we we speak in in the emotions that we experience without restraint. How many times have we found ourselves saying something, regrettably, but in the heat of the moment, we make the excuse, well, well, I I was mad, I was frustrated, I, 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 I was, you know, Whatever, my blood sugar was low. I don't, I don't know right? what our excuses are. But also think of the effects bitterness has on the things we say and how we speak of those who make us bitter. Right? Think about how we react when our pride is attacked or when we are offended. Right? The demeanor of our tongue and speech change dramatically in a matter of what? A second. I would even go as, as say it. I would go as far as saying milliseconds. Why? Because the tongue is what? A world of unrighteousness. It's it's something that we have to pay attention to. You see, the tongue is set among our members, meaning there's no taking it away, right, if you wish to continue speaking. It's something that we have to live with, and if it is something that we have to live with, then it's something that we need to have a better grasp of in hopes of controlling it. However, James says, right, being a set member of our body, the tongue pollutes the entire body, right? It it pollutes our being. The the Greek translation says it pollutes, it defiles, defiles, and it corrupts the whole person, literally and figuratively. John MacArthur says that like a physical fire, The destructive effects of evil speech expand, not only contaminating ourselves, but also everything we influence throughout the course of our life. To a large extent, we are known by the way we talk. Over the long haul, what we say gives others a pretty 
good idea of who and what we really are. All because of what? Of, of our speech, the way that we speak, the way that we talk of others, the way that we might talk of things and express ourselves. He continues by saying that principle applies to good things as well as sinful. But James's emphasis here is entirely on the negative aspect of our speaking, such as gossip, slander, false accusations, lying, filthy language, and stories, and other sins of the tongue. That can destroy individual lives, families, schools, churches, and even communities. This is a tongue that is a world of unrighteousness. And once again, right, we could talk about all the great things about the tongue, but here for us, right, James wants to focus on the dark side of this thing that allows us to articulate speech from our mouths. You see, verse 7 lists all the things that can be tamed. Or has been tamed by man. Or you have every kind of beast, bird, reptile, sea creature. But the irony of it all is that what? Even though man has been able to tame those things, even though that God has, uh, has spoken to us, right, that we are to have dominion and to tame these things, the one thing that man cannot tame alone is what? The tongue. The thing we have to understand about taming created things is this. Right? It's easier to tame the less primitive, the less civilized. Right? It's easier to control those things. But when it comes to our own tongue, it is one of the most difficult things to do. And you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what, your, what your language is or what your preference of words are or how you like to express yourself. And I, for one, am not one to... Um, shame those who might use colorful language, if that makes sense. Right? I think colorful language is the least of our problems. But I think the thing that we as a people need to focus more on is the content of the things that we are saying. Right? And so not, not, that, I'm, not, that, I, uh, not that I am not that I'm saying it's okay to, to drop four letter, five letter words and, and certain phrases Right, rambunctiously. I'm, that's not what I'm saying. But I think the thing that we as the people of God need to be more concerned about is the context of the things that we say. The way that we might speak of others. Right, the way that we might belittle one another. The way that we might uh, criticize. Right, those things we as a church need to be more mindful of. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So let's take a look at verses 8 to 10, right? And we'll try to put this all into perspective when it comes to the tongue. And verse 8 says, But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of poison. Right? With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Right? The irony of that. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to to be so. So if we're trying to put this all into perspective, I think there's three things that stand out for us. When we look at verse 8, verse 8 uh, tells us the humble reality of the tongue. And what is that? What is the humble reality of the tongue? No human being can tame it. Right? We, are, we are incapable right, as individuals of taming the tongue. But the key word there is human. Right? No human being, right? That doesn't mean God cannot tame our tongues, right? In fact, I think God is the one who is able to, to spur up that change, that, that conscious effort in us for us to be mindful of the things that we say. And I believe that God uh, can tame our, our tongues, um, but the reality of the situation is that man cannot tame their tongues. See, in fact, there's a slide for this, by the way, right? Then there's the identity, right, for the tongue, right? There's the identity of the tongue. And if, what is the identity of the tongue? It is uh, found in our sinful nature, right? It is a restless evil full of poison. And I think that we need, the thing that we need to take a moment to pause and focus on is how the tongue can be poisonous, right? And I don't know how many of you individuals are familiar with how poison works. Hopefully you don't have any firsthand experience. Hopefully you've only learned about it and its effects, 
But the way that a poison works is what? Is that it slowly enters the body and does what? It spreads. Right? It spreads. And when it comes to the tongue, when it comes to the things that we say, for a moment we might laugh. For a moment we might brush it off. But if you are anything like me, the things that people say or the way that think, you think you way you're spoken to has a tendency to kind of slowly replay. And if hurtful things are said to you, things that criticize you, things that uh, belittle you, things that dehumanize you, what happens to those things? They don't just leave, but somehow they find their way of just constantly staying in our bodies and slowly but surely continually making its way to our head to relive that moment to try to decipher why someone might say such a thing to you and so forth. But the thing that we have to understand is that the tongue is full of poison, meaning that it is able to have a lasting effect, a negative effect when it comes to the hurtful things that are said. That this is the identity of the tongue when it is used and abused in a way that is not edifying and glorifying to God. And so for us, the, the thing that we must be careful of, the thing that we must be wary of, wary of is the things that we might say to those around us. And sometimes we want to be as truthful and brutally honest. And, and sometimes that's not necessary. Oftentimes, or I say most of the times, when it comes to saying the harsh reality or saying the things that people need to hear, we as, as people who have experienced the love of Christ, we must prayerfully and discernfully figure out ways to say things that people need to hear, but use as much grace and love in our speech, right? Does it make sense? Because sometimes hearing the things that you need to hear, like that, that's going to hurt regardless. But when it is done out of love, when it is done with much grace, even though it stings for a moment, there's healing as well that takes place. But when we say things out of a reaction, when we say things that are hurtful, that's when it leaves a lasting impact and creates a lasting damage right in the way that a poison will work. So, what's, so when we talk about the reality and the identity, then what is the purpose of the tongue? Well, in, in our sinful nature, there is a troubled purpose when it comes to our tongue, right? And I, I'm pretty sure we've heard this verse many, many times. But James says the dilemma is this. In one instance, we, we praise God, right? We, we sing the praises of God. We glorify his name. We say all the things that are pleasing to his ear. And then somehow, some, somewhere along the, the lines, in the same breath or even the same moment, we, we curse people with it. Right? I, I think I, the, the most ironic thing that, that happens is, you know, I, I could be driving in my car, and oftentimes I'm listening to like Christian praise music, right? and, I, and I'm singing along, I'm, I'm, I'm getting my praise on. And then something happens in traffic, next thing you know, flip of a switch, like I'm going from praising to, to cursing people. Right? This is the reality of life. This is the troubled purpose of our tongue. But this isn't the way that we are to live. Right? This isn't the way that we are to use this, this, this powerful gift that God has blessed us with. Right, the tongue is troubled. Right? It does one thing and then does another, which doesn't reflect the first. Right? We can go from praising God to saying hurtful things, or as James says, that we can go from praising God to cursing the very people that God loves, right? This is the reality of the situation that we live in. And that's troubling, right? And so while we understand that the tongue is troubled, while we understand that it's hard to control, right, it's a hard to control evil, right, because we use it to worship God, right, because we use it to praise Him, because we use it to testify of His love and greatness, that means we must be mindful. James says it's untamable, right? 
James says it's, it's an untamable beast. But I know somebody who is able to tame our tongues. Right? When we look in the, when we see in the book of Acts, right, we see just a, 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 how great of an influence God has on our tongue. So here, right, in this instance, James is referring to the, to the, e- the, the evilish hell that it is, right, set on fire by hell. But then we see in, in Acts how the tongue is redeemable and how God is able to use that for his greater purpose, for his greater glory. Because as we see the Holy Spirit descend for the very first time, it, ha- it descends like what? Scripture tells us that it descends like what? Fire. And as a result, the people who were anointed in that moment were speaking a language that was not their own. And so instead of praising God and saying hurtful things, they were praising God. And God used that to speak and to uh, encourage and affirm those who were kind of just getting acquainted with the gospel. And they said, how is it that they're speaking our language? Right? That is God's doing. And so we have to understand that even though the tongue is untamable, I do believe that God is able to tame it. And that's what makes our maturity, our growth, our walking with Christ so important. Because as we are continually walking with Christ, as we are continually surrounding ourselves with the things of Christ, as we are being, cre- uh, being made more and more like Christ, then that growth and maturity is going to be reflected in the way that we speak. And I think if you were to talk to any seasoned Christian, any follower of Christ who is truly maturing in their faith, the way that they would speak to others and the way that they would speak of others and the way that they would speak in a reaction is quite different than those who are still young in their years of following Jesus. That in and of itself is proof enough that the tongue is tameable not by our own doing, but by our walking and our continued maturity when it comes to knowing Jesus more and more. So in verse 11 to 12, James illustrates this image of purposed creation producing what it was created to do or what it wasn't created to do, right? Or in our case, the way that the gospel might work in our lives. He says, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. You see, James is saying that having good and evil spew from our mouths is the equivalent of what fresh water and spring water coming out of our mouth. It's not supposed to be. Right? It's not natural. Or in the case of the fig tree, a fig tree cannot what bear olives and a grapevine cannot produce figs. And in the case of our identity as Christians, as followers of Christ, as people who are saved and redeemed, we understand the power and the implications of the tongue. Right? We know what, is capa- what it is capable of, and we know for what purpose we have a tongue. Are we perfect? No. Is it a struggle to have a tamed tongue? Oh, yes. Is it an excuse to say whatever the heck that we want? Absolutely not. You see, we have been saved and redeemed, right? Uh, We have been born again. We have a new identity thanks to Jesus. And because of that, we are to live our lives a certain way. And I do believe that because of Jesus, by the power of Jesus, by the blood of the cross, that our tongues are are also redeemable. Our tongues can be used. Right, to set a forest on fire, not to destroy it, but to right, spread the gospel, to spread, to, to ignite, to influence and mobilize the church. You see, Charles Spurgeon puts this into a better perspective for us. He says, it would be a monstrosity, a thing to be wondered at and, right, and stared at as unnatural and absurd if a fig tree started bearing olive berries. Right, and it is just as unnatural for a Christian to live in what? In sin. Can he, can he so live as to bear the fruits of iniquity instead of the fruits of, of righteousness? Right, God forbid that it should be so. Unless you are regenerated, born from above by a new and heavenly birth, you are not what? Christians. Whatever you may be called, you cannot produce the fruit which is acceptable to God 
any more than a fig tree can produce olive berries. In other words, right, you cannot produce something that you are not. If we truly do believe ourselves to be followers of Christ, if we truly do believe ourselves to be Christians, those who have been saved and redeemed by the blood of Jesus, then it is unnatural for us to praise God and to turn and to use our, our very same mouth to curse men, to belittle, to degrade people, to cause pain and hurt intentionally. Right? Are we perfect? No. Do we slip up? Yes. But to live a continued lifestyle that is reflective of both the fresh and the salt water when we have been called to be a fresh water spring. Right? Doesn't make sense. You see, you can label a, a fig tree, olive tree, but that will not make it an olive tree. It will still be a fig tree that produces what? Figs. You can trim a fig tree to make it resemble that of an olive tree. But guess what? It will still be a fig tree that produces figs, not olives. And you can treat a fig tree like an olive tree. You can surround it with other olive trees, hoping that it blends in. You can even take a fig tree and plant it on the Mount of Olives. But that won't turn it into an olive tree. You see, our tongues, even though they cannot be tamed on our own, we have been born again. Right? We do believe that we are what? Saved and redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And if that is truly the confession of our heart, if that is truly the confession of our lives, then I believe that it can be tamed. It can be redeemed to be used to, to magnify and to glorify God, to, to go and to make disciples of, of all nations. Right? We can be changed, right, to, and be used to set ablaze not a fire of destruction, but a fire of the Lord. And so as it pertains to faith with works, which is really where all of this stems from, right, this conversation of what does it mean to have faith and what does it mean to have works, what does it mean to be a doer and not just a hearer of the word, right, those things, right, hearing and receiving the word of God is something that should ultimately find its way not only into our lives, not only into the way that we might live and conduct ourselves, but also how we might speak of the Lord, how we might speak to others in a way that is full of, of love and seasoned with grace and mercy. And so as it pertains with works, I believe that our tongues can attest to the faith that we have by the way that we speak, by the way that we would speak to others, and how we would even speak of others. If we are truly saved and redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, then things like, like gossip and, and, and spreading false rumors or, or speaking of people in, in a way that is degrading is something that should not be a persistent presence in our lives. But it should be something that has found its way out and has no longer has a place in our lives because as we speak of others, ultimately, right, in the same breath, we should, without hesitation, without restraint, without guilt, be able to praise, to say the many great things of God, and to turn around and invite others into that same conversation. Or to say with the same praise that we praise God, that should have much grace, love, and mercy sprinkled or seasoned in our speech. Because as we glorify God, the way that we treat others, the way that we might speak to others, and the way that we might speak of others... Who is glorified in that? Jesus is continually glorified right, in, our, in our actions, in our conduct, because we are not only hearers of the words, but we are doers. Right? God is glorified in, in, in our faith that is accompanied by what? By works. And so we must not only, we must not only understand the power of the tongue, but also see how God is able to use the power of our tongues when we truly reflect people who are saved and redeemed by his very gospel. You can't make a fig tree an olive tree, right? And you can't fake being a Christian because you say certain things, 
You know how to say, how to have the, you have the lingo down, you have the vocabulary words, you have the theology words down. That will not make you a follower of Christ. But what makes us a follower of Christ is a way that we live our lives in a way that is continually glorifying to God and reflective of the genuine faith that we have in Jesus. Amen? Amen. So let us understand the power of the tongue and may we use it wisely to not only praise our Heavenly Father, but to use it to love others so that God would continually be known and glorified. Let us stand and we'll close in prayer tonight. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. God, I know that for us, uh, for I guess many of us, the, the tongue is something that can be very difficult uh, to control, especially uh, when we are met with uh, an array of emotions, uh, when we are caught off guard, uh, God, when we are, we are uh, frustrated or preoccupied with other things. And my Father, I pray that you would help us to better understand really the power and the implications that the tongue have. That we understand that it can be a world of unrighteousness. We understand that things that we say can be hurtful. And we know that the tongue can act as a deadly poison, leaving a lasting effect from the things that we might say to others. And so, Father, I pray that the way that we speak uh, to others, the way that we would speak of others would not be something that is poisonous, but something that is healing, something that is affirming, something that is encouraging, and most importantly, something that is glorifying and edifying to you. And so, Father, I pray that the power of our tongues would not be used for evil, but that our power, the power of the, our tongues would be used for your kingdom and for your glory, that it would be used for your good and your good alone. And so, Father, to help us to be a people who is maturing. God, help us to be a people who not only pray, who praise you and in the same breath and with the same mouth uh, turn and love others the way that you have loved them. And so, Father, may we continually be a vessel that is used by you to continually shine a light on you and to spread your love and your gospel. We thank you. And now we just ask that the grace uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ and that the unconditional love of God the Father, and may the anointing, the power, the wisdom, the presence, the guidance of the Holy Spirit truly equip us, lead us, and guide us until we meet in your house once again. Amen and amen. Thank you, church. May you go in peace.